Stephanie and Toby Hansen and Kate. Well, good to see you, too. Good, good to see you. Good to see you, Joe. That's good. Yeah. That's really cool. Thank you. Good to see you. These are my colleagues. Yes, sir. Good to see you. Hey, Toby. Hey. Grand Central. Yes, Toby Hansen. Good to see you. Good to see you, guys. So, well, welcome to the court. Look forward to your arguments. Looking Thank forward. You. Thank you. All rise. The honorables, the presiding judge, and judges of the Court of Appeals of the State of North Carolina. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. The Court of Appeals is now in session. God save the state and this honorable court. Be seated. Welcome to the Court of Appeals. I'm Judge Valerie Zachary. To my right is Judge Toby Hansen, and to my left is Judge Carolyn Thompson. On the calendar this afternoon, we have Vivian Federowitz, am I pronouncing that correctly? Okay. Um, versus the North Carolina Board of Chiropractic Examiners on appeal from Wake County Superior Court. Uh, counsel, have you already, uh, y'all ready pr to proceed? Please. 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. May it please the court. My name is Robin Vinson. I'm a member of the Raleigh Bar of Longstanding. Um, I have had the pleasure of representing uh, the appellant today, Dr. Vivian Ferowitz, in this appeal from a state agency decision. We'd like to reserve 10 minutes for a rebuttal. You know, it seems like just yesterday that um, I was here in this courtroom um, when I was clerking for Judge Morris back when um, she was in her prime. And so it's with great pleasure that I have the ability to come into this courtroom and, um, and be a part of the judiciary of the state. Um, it's a very special place. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, the, the, the plaintiff, uh, Fed, Vivian Federer, which, which she sits right here uh, behind me, um, is a licensed chiropractor doing, uh, doing business and practicing in North Carolina. This is an appeal from a state occupational agency, uh, which was created by chapter, chapter 90 of the North Carolina General Statutes. Um, and um, the purpose of this appeal is to, is to blatantly challenge, excuse me, blatantly to challenge um, the decision of this state agency um, without reference, without regard, or without the pre-existing condition of having a rule, regulation, or some sort of position statement by which my client should have been judged or could have been judged. At the end of that process, the petition, the, we filed a petition for, for um, judicial review um, under um, NC Gen Stat Section 150B-43, which provides that a party aggrieved by a final decision in a contested case may seek judicial review. That was affirmed on, on June the 14th, 2022, uh, by Judge Collins in Wake County. A notice of appeal was given July the 11th, 2023, and we are here today. The grounds for appeal are under um, Section 7A-27B um, of the, of the uh, general statutes which allow um, appeal to the um, appellate court here from a final judgment of a superior court order. So that, and, and for me, that's a great jumping off point in terms of kind of what, what standard and, and type of review we are to apply in this case. As, as you say, I think your, your arguments are articulated in a, in a very sort of direct manner and, and um, uh, you know, attacking the, the sort of the board's regulation of this practice, but you know, in the, the, the nature of some of these administrative proceedings being that you know it, it was first reviewed by the Superior Court, right? Itself right. sitting not as a trial court, but as as, as a reviewing body in and of itself. And, and our role as an appellate court here is simply to review that order, right? To determine whether the trial court applied the correct standard of review, number one, and then if it applied the correct standard of review, whether it applied it correctly. And so, I'm. One of the things I'm wondering about here is, is, is how do we review your arguments within the context of Judge Collins's order here? Judge Collins uh, set forth each of our uh, uh, assignments of error, um, and there, are, there were four of them. Um, they were, they, with respect to the order in them, uh, it was the first um, order of sanction was, um, was, order, was decision number two of the administrative um, proceeding um, and that he agreed and we contend that that decision should be um, ruled, uh, should be considered under the de, de novo standard as opposed to the whole test it, or the whole record standard. If you look at 150B, you know, there are six, there are six choices here, right? I don't know if you have that available. I do. Okay, so with respect to your challenge to conclusion of law two, which one of those applies to it? Well, we, we believe that um, both with respect to conclusion of law number two and conclusion of law number three, as well as the order of mandate, which was 
number six in the mandate order. Those three should be considered de novo with respect to uh, 150B-51, uh, where it was in violation of constitutional provisions, was in, in excess of the statutory authority or jurisdiction of the agency, was made upon unlawful procedure or affected by other area of law. Okay, so you think all four of those apply? No, I do not. Those oh, are the okay. four items which require a de novo review. Yes, sir. We contend that the, 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 the agency's order was in excess of the statutory authority or jurisdiction of the agency, um, which is section 51 sub 2, close okay. to. So that's with, con with regard to conclusion of law 2, 3, and order mandate 6? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then for order mandate 4, which one do you think applies? Which is the uh, order of attorney's fees uh, and costs. Um, yeah. We believe, and I think the judge um, set this out in his order, um, that it was um, under number five and number six, unsupported by substantial evidence in view of the whole record as submitted, uh, or, and we would contend here it's, it's and, um, arbitrary, capricious, or an abuse of discretion. Okay, so both of them on, on order mandate four? Yes, ma'am, okay. that, that's the okay. way, that's our position. Okay, all right, thank you very much. There, you know, there was another issue here, the, the issue of unethical conduct regarding the false advertising as to um, specialization. Yes, ma'am, that was not appealed. It was not. Um, do, you, do you contend that the discipline ordered by the board could be in any way justified by that unethical conduct? Um, no, I do not. Okay, why not? Because of the very nature of conclusion of law number three, number two, and the mandate under um, order number six. If you look at those specific, um, those specific items, um, it's our argument that the board did not have jurisdiction or the authority to, re to regulate the private conduct of Dr. Federowitz under, uh, under the de novo review. And so I guess it would be your contention that um, at a minimum this, this case would, would need to just be remanded because we don't, we don't know what discipline might otherwise have been imposed for the false advertising, right? And that, that, that should, but, that, but it may not have warranted suspension. It might have warranted a, a lesser degree of, of sanction or, or if any. It is our position that the court has the power independently of, of the first um, issue relating to the advertising um, to just simply reverse the first, second, and third arguments. And with respect to number four, to remand it for further proceedings for a finding of reasonableness. But if you consider that there is no measure and it wasn't delineated separately, um, then it would be the court's um, authority and position to to remand it for further proceedings without a finding of number one. Um, as a matter of fact, we just simply removed the word that they had a problem with from the advertising. So with respect to the first argument, they found disciplinary action was necessary under 90-154B5 because of a decision that Judge Federowitz made. That's what this whole case boils down to, is a decision that was made at 3.30 on July the 10th of last year, of 2022, um, for her to leave the home of the birth mother. But is that, I, I think what the argument I, I, I anticipate hearing from your, from your colleagues is that, is that yes, Obviously, that was that sort of made perhaps the critical moment in in this in in, in this narrative and in, in, in these events. But that but that everything transpiring before that kind of created a course of conduct 
and a course, I think they would contend, of, of chiropractic care and chiropractic practice, leading, you know, creating the expectation of, of, of chiropractic care being given in that, in that instance, and, and that it wasn't just limited to uh, your, your client's visit to the home on, on, on the night of the, of the birth. Well, um, Your Honor, with respect to that, I believe that the, that the administrative agency has both explained that and has limited the scope of this appeal by setting out in disciplinary action number two the very facts that they were relying on in dealing with this. They said that Dr. Federowitz should have secured appropriate care for this patient because she was aware that a 33-year-old patient had no prior experience in giving birth, had not had an ultrasound, and for some reason, a period of time, had not been receiving medical prenatal care. And that my client knew that the patient's water broke and that that was before she left, and that when she left at a time when the patient was laboring, um, she knew or should have known that a midwife or other medical provider was not present and may or may not have been forthcoming. She failed to secure appropriate care for the patient on those facts, on those particular facts. So the, the administrative agency has made our jobs much simpler because it's that decision that she made at 3.30 the afternoon to excuse herself after having visited with the, at the birth home with this, uh, the, this couple um, because she had other. So, so what you're saying is the conclusion of law or part two, conclusion of law two relates solely to the, to the time of birth. Yes. And, and differentiated from maybe conclusion of law three, do you, is it your contention that conclusion of law three is actually more directed to the course of care? So these are two separate, that the, the board was treating these as two separate violations. Yes, okay. yes, I do. Thank they are two separate violations. Okay. Uh, for instance, if you look at uh, the second one, which is um, conclusion of law number three, um, the agency said that the disciplinary action is appropriate under 154B7 and that she failed to render acceptable care by failing to properly examine, document, and manage, manage the care of a pregnant patient, including the times in which the respondent, Dr. Federowitz, knew that no other provider was providing care. And if you noodle through what 154B7 does, it makes reference to Chapter 90, 3 which sets out the practice of chiropractic. And these are the things that this this, this administrative agency was allowed to regulate. They're not allowed to regulate anything else except what is right here on this page. The examination and diagnosis of chiropractic care, the use of chiropractic treatment, the physiological um, therapeutic agents, diagnostic radiology, the maintenance of patient records, and the sanitation, safety, and adequacy of clinical equipment. And as a matter of law, judgments on a decision with reference to a patient pregnant um, at a time when she was in labor or, or was about to be in labor um, and the, the, the unfortunate result, that's not within this agency's jurisdiction. It's not within this agency's authority. And, I, and, and further, uh, when I talk about the two complaining doctors, Dr. Lavin and Dr. Perez, they basically were holding this chiropractor to a standard of an OBGYN. So what, what role was your client in on, on the day in question? Our position is that, the, the, um, that Dr. Federowitz was there as a friend. Uh, because this woman did not have family. Um, she was um, Hispanic, and it was hard for her to communicate 
with other people, and she was there to, uh, as I understand it, to provide food, um, drink, and so forth. The, th there's a dispute as to the timing of all that. There's a dispute on the facts, but that doesn't really matter because the court, the, the, the agency, in their opinion and order, has set out what facts are necessary to reach the conclusion they did. And for the court, for the administrative agency to say that this, this chiropractor um, was, was engaging in the practice of chiropractic when she visited at that home and provided support and so forth, it's just not in the statute. Now, there are several things which are in the chiropractic, uh, on the website, in which the, the, the chiropractic board has issued guidelines and position statements. Um, the, the, the preparation of medical records there is a two or three page opinion, uh, position statement which sets out exactly the initial exam of a chiropractic patient and subsequent diagnoses. There's one on treatment plans and uh, there, there's one, uh, there are three or four others which tell these, these licensees exactly how they're supposed to do it, which is beyond the statute here. And to the extent that they're permitted to write those permission statements, and it is guidance, then that would have been very instructive. As you see at the end of my brief, that's one of the very first things I did with the board. I wrote them and I said, there doesn't appear to be a position statement or any rule or regulation with respect to the chiropractic care of a pregnant patient. What about the general statute 90-151 that talks about exceeding the extent of the license, the limitations that come with being a chiropractic um, person in that room, whether she's a friend or not? But what about 90-151 that talks about exceeding the scope of your license? Um, Judge Thompson, um, Dr. Federowitz um, brought on this this, this patient, um, the birth mother, as a patient in December of, of 2021, and up until July, was continuing to treat her and then treated her afterwards. During that period of time, they became friends. They they just they swapped stories and so forth. And at the time that she was in the home, she it is our position that she wasn't acting as a birth attendant or a midwife or anything. And when it was obvious to her that it was her time to leave, uh, she left, but she wasn't outside the scope of any practice because she wasn't practicing chiropractic or not. The good thing about that observation is that I don't find it anywhere in the agency's order, in, in, in the ruling on on the appeal uh, in, in Superior Court. And I just don't find it anywhere in the, in the administrative agency's decision where they said that this woman was outside the scope of chiropractic. They could have said that, but they did not. And so our job now is to focus on what what the, what, the, what the administrative decision did say. Well, what it, what it does say, and, and particularly if we focus on conclusion of law number two, is that it, it, was, it was the failure to secure appropriate care in that circumstance, which is, which is the act being disciplined here. And so I guess the question is, is, is what, what duty does a chiropractor have, maybe perhaps greater than the general public, to ensure a patient, or for that matter, a friend, is being provided proper medical care in a situation. For example, if a chiropractor came, hypothetically, a chiropractor came across somebody on the street having a heart attack, does a chiropractor have a duty to secure proper care for that person? Or if they come across a patient having a heart attack, or if a patient has a heart attack in their office, do they have a duty to secure adequate care for that patient. Yeah, on, um, Judge Hampson, I went to some length on the second or third argument in my brief um, to suggest that um, these are moral decisions 
without some specific position statement, I don't think, uh, I, I just, I, it's my position, in our position, that under the circumstances, um, this, the, the administrative agency did not reach a decision that this woman's decision was a violation of any obligation to manage her medical care. Excuse me, what if it's, what, in, in, in changing his hypothetical a little bit, what if the, the chiropractor comes across a patient who's relying on the chiropractor? Does that change the dynamics? Does that change what you're, what you're saying now? Uh, in fact, that's what they said in the administrative decision, that she failed to provide appropriate care at a time when she knew or should have known that the patient didn't have another provider. Well, that the pa did the patient testify that uh, that she thought that the, that Dr. Federitz was going to uh, assist her in prenatal care and in management of her pregnancy? Um, there's a there's a whole um, fact controversy over that very point. Um, the good news is that we don't have to go there for the purposes of our situation here because there is no position statement that says, for instance, that in the, in the case of a chiropractic patient that is pregnant and the, the chiropractor knows or should know that the patient is not being managed by a medical doctor or, or a certified and licensed med, uh, nurse midwife, uh, that they have an obligation to micromanage those decisions. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a case where um, if, if the position statement said that in the care of a pregnant patient, if you know that the patient um, is, is not being taken care of, then you have an obligation to go and find a doctor for that, that chiropractic patient. Counselor, your time is, you've, you're into your rebuttal time. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to uh, wrap this up so that I can. Um, and so the, the point there is, and I think it's well worth um, repeating, is that in the case of that situation, um, without, without a position statement or a rule or regulation that says in the treatment of a, of a pregnant chiropractic patient, you have a continuing duty of care to manage the medical aspects of this prenatal um, situation, but there, there's no standard that says that. And for them to back into it, and then in, in order number six, which was the third argument, for them to say that this, this chiropractor does have that standard without saying that there was a standard to begin with is abuse of discretion and is beyond the authority of this administrative agency. And I'll reserve the six and a few minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. We can probably give you a little extra since, uh, since we were peppering you with questions. Proceed, please. May it please the court. My name is Grant Simpkins, and I'm here on behalf of the North Carolina State Board of Chiropractic Examiners. This board has the jurisdiction and the statutory authority to discipline a licensee who is found to have violated the Board's Practice Act. And we ask that this court affirm the decision of the Wake County Superior Court for two reasons. First, the conclusions of law in the Board's final agency decision are supported by the evidence in the record, the testimony at hearing, and the board is the proper body to determine whether or not a licensee has committed negligence or failed to render appropriate care in the practice. Secondly, the board has discretion to impose discipline on a licensee who is found to have violated the board's rules and statutes. I will be addressing the issues as they are presented to this court, starting with conclusion of law number two and three. The court below correctly held that conclusion of law number two is supported by the evidence, supported by the record, and the board has clear statutory authority to determine whether or not a licensee has committed negligence in the practice of the profession. And as you know, when this court is reviewing the order of a superior court, we're looking at first 
whether the, board, the court applied the correct standard of review, and then if it applied that standard of review correctly to this decision. And the answer in this case is yes. The Superior Court below found as a fact that the petitioner failed to keep adequate clinical notes, failed to perform a proper examination on the patient, and based on the evidence at the hearing, found that conclusion of law too, that petitioner engaged in negligence in the practice of chiropractic, was proper determination by this board. Excuse me, Counselor, where was the practice of chiropractic? What do you contend it started? The practice of chiropractic began in December 22nd of 2021 and continued through in August of 2022. So we're starting at the first date at which the patient in this case came into the petitioner's office for an appointment on December 21st, filled out new patient paperwork, and subsequently began attending chiropractic appointments at the office. So is it your contention, you know, I think the way I understood your, your colleague's argument was the conclusion of law two and conclusion of law three constituted separate violations, separate independent violations, right? The conclusion of law three kind of focused more on the, 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 the course of, of the treatment of the, of the care, whereas conclusion of law two rather focuses on the night or night or day of the birth itself. And that, and that as the argument is released to the conclusion of law number two is that that was not the practice of law or practice of chiropractic versus, you know, even, even assuming three was that, that two is a separate act altogether and in a separate violation altogether and that we're reviewing those independently and, and applying a different analysis to each. How do you respond to that? Both conclusion of law two on negligence and conclusion of law three for the appropriate standard of care are tied to the practice of chiropractic from December through August when the patient was eventually discharged. And this goes directly to a question that Judge Thompson asked before about 90-151. And if we look at the order in paragraph uh, conclusion of law number two, it cites to 90-154B5 with respect to negligence. But what it did not cite to is 90 154 B18, violating the provisions of 90-151 regarding the extent and limitation of license. So if conclusion of law two was aimed at something beyond the scope of chiropractic, and we're looking at the date of July 10th when the, when the petitioner was at the patient's home for the birth, the board would have, could have cited something about the extent and limitation of license, but that's not what is included in the conclusion of law number two. What's included in there is negligence, incompetence, or malpractice in the practice of the profession. So what the board was clearly looking at with conclusion of law number two, and with the same with conclusion of law number three, was negligence in the practice of chiropractic. And that began in December of 2021 and continued all the way in through August of 2022. Well, and so negligence under our law is, you know, is, is, is very much sort of a defined term with very specific elements, right? It's, it's not necessarily just establishing the standard of care, right? It's establishing a breach of that standard of care. It's also establishing proximate causation between the alleged negligent act and the resulting harm. So where was that litigated and tried before, before the board? Were those issues tried? I mean, I, I mean even, even assuming that a board can, is, is a board of experts can determine the standard of care. Sure. Where, where, where are the determinations of, of things like proximate cause and, and duty and, and, and breach in, in the board's order? So the, the negligence standard here isn't in the traditional tortious sense of negligence when the board isn't going proximate cause, causation in that sense, but it's looking at the standard of care and whether or not that was breached. So when we're looking at determining the standard of care of a, a licensed chiropractor in the state, as you reference, the board is made up of experts and has a determination of what that is. That's a straightforward application of the Leahy and Watkins decision from the North Carolina Supreme Court, which says agencies like the Board of Chiropractic Examiners are made up of experts. They can determine what the standard of care is based on the evidence presented to it, and then determine whether or not there was a breach of that standard of care. So when we look at the finding of facts that were included in the board's final decision, because that's necessary to support a conclusion of law, even under a de novo standard of review, is that from December 22nd, 2021, through August 3rd, all treatment records are identical. There's not a single thing that's different in any of those records. 
There's no vital signs, no examination done or, or documented. There's no re-examination during the course of the treatment for over a seven month period. The techniques that were performed during the chiropractic appointments were not documented anywhere. So those are breaches of the standard of care, which is the board specifically found in conclusion of law number three. And that's interrelated to what the board found in conclusion of law number two. It's because all of these things occurred without properly documenting, examining, and treating that patient that the results were negligence in the practice of the profession. Regardless of what occurred on July 10 of 2022, everything that leads up, up until that point, independent of itself, could have been found to be negligence in the practice of chiropractic and failure to render acceptable care in the profession. So splitting up two and three for a minute, and you, your argument right now is sort of focused on conclusion of law number three. Um, did the board, number one, articulate what the standard of care is uh, under uh, for conclusion of law number three for the you know for documenting and, and and for that course of treatment there was no testimony at the hearing as to what the standard of care is but that's exactly what the but where, did, the, did the board itself in its order articulate that standard so that the reviewing court could then look and determine because because i mean surely uh a board's determination of what the standard of care is has to be based on something and cannot just be arbitrary and capriciously invented by the board on a whim. Right. If you look at conclusion of law number three, it doesn't just end with respondent violated 90-154.3. It says rendered, failed to render acceptable care in the practice of the profession by failing to properly examine, document, and manage the care of a patient, including such times that respondent knew no other provider was providing care. So what it's saying there is, you violated this provision, and here's how you violated it, by failing to properly examine, document, and manage the care of the profession. So that would be the articulation of the standard that the board found was violated under 90-154.3. Well, it says as defined in NCGS 90-154.3 sub A, does that give the, does, is that the standard of care, you think? In 90-154.3, Subsection A says it is unlawful for a doctor of chiropractic to examine, treat, or render any professional service for a patient that does not conform to the standard of care. And then it provides an area that the board may establish rules on, not shall establish rules on. So what that is saying is the board sets what the standard of care is, and the standard of care is relating to examination, treatment, and professional services. And then based on the Leahy and Watkins decision, the board is then able to determine whether or not that standard of care has actually been met by the practitioner. Well then, and then so moving to conclusion of law number two, uh, where, where's the articulation of the standard of care? And I mean, what is the standard of care from the board standpoint for uh, a chiropractor in this situation to secure appropriate care. What is, what is that standard? What do, how, you know, how are we to measure that against another case? And I think it's important to look at for what, when negligence occurs or this standard of care is breached is going to be a very fact specific issue, right? We're looking at for this one patient was negligence committed in the practice of chiropractic? And the board found yes, that it was, and that's based on extensive findings of fact in the final agency decision that outline where that negligence occurred. You know, when we're looking at 38 different office visits where the clinical notes are all the exact same, and that's from, you know, weeks 12 and on in a pregnancy, and there was no change in the clinical notes, there was no change in the pain, there was nothing ever documented that showed the progression of that patient or what the new, um, symptoms or issues that that patient was having. There was... Uh, but the but conclusion of law number two, as, as I read and I think has been argued by your colleague, is focused specifically on, on the labor and birth itself. And I guess my, my question is, what is the standard of care for a chiropractor in that situation to secure... What duty does a chiropractor in that situation have to secure appropriate care yep. and, and where's that articulated I guess and Judge Zachary can probably articulate my question. Well, no, no. I, 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 no doubt. I was just so. gonna ask you know, for, for a patient. Right. 
as opposed to I, as opposed to like we were talking about earlier, you know, uh, just a, a person on the street. Sure, and in this case, the board, you know, a lot of focus is on what happened on July 10th, but the testimony and the evidence in the record is not solely related to what happened on July 10th. If everything had gone well on July 10th and the birth was successful, but we still had a complaint filed with the board and we looked at the clinical records and we looked at the documentation and the notes and the lack of techniques documented in there, no blood pressure, no vital signs, no examination ever performed, that's still going to be negligence in the practice of the profession or but, failure to render acceptable care. But here you specifically state negligence by failing to secure appropriate care for a patient, period. That's correct. And I mean, in, in, again, in this case, there was a testimony in the, in the record that from the patient um, that she was told by the petitioner, I'm your primary care provider. You don't need to see any other practitioners. I can help you with this process. The, the patient had no experience with childbirth as is documented in conclusion of law two, had no experience with this medical practice when looking at childbirth. And the petitioner appellant noted that I can do all of these things for you. You can give, this, give birth at home. We will be there to, with you while you were giving birth at home. The patient is under the understanding that this is her doctor and she even testified that I understood a primary care physician to mean I don't need to see anybody else for my pregnancy care. So when we're looking at what happened with this specific patient, regardless again of what happened on July 10th, the petitioner is holding herself out as being able to provide all potential scope of coverage for a prenatal or medical care, and that begins to slide into the negligence in this case. And that's, again, documented in conclusion of law number one, with the unethical conduct through the advertising as a, as a professional and that specializes in uh, prenatal care for chiropractic. So is it your contention then that there was negligence in that, um, that the patient was led to believe that she was going to provide care and if she wasn't going to, then she should have secured alternative care? That's correct. And again, it's, it's documented throughout the findings of fact and the evidence in the record that says Here's, the, here's what a chiropractor should do. You should take vital signs. You should perform a proper examination of a patient. You should document, update your clinical notes throughout the, the treatment of this patient, particularly somebody who's going through the final you know, six months of a pregnancy. And failure to do all of those things and take those appropriate steps with respect to this patient was negligence in the practice of chiropractic. And again, None of the findings of fact that are included in the board's final agency decision have been challenged on the petition for judicial review. So all of those are going to be, they were binding on the Superior Court and they're binding here as well. And as this court said in Farlow versus North Carolina Board of Chiropractic Examiners, the board is made up of fact finders. And once you perform that fact finding duty, the board is made up of experts who then can form opinions based on those facts that are presented. And the Superior Court's order with respect to conclusion of Law 2 said that it was supported by the findings that Dr. Fedorovich failed to keep adequate clinical records, failed to perform proper examinations, and was supported by the evidence in the record and the testimony at the hearing. And so we contend that conclusion of Law Number 2 and the, board, the court below's decision with respect to conclusion of Law Number 2 should be affirmed. And with conclusion of Law Number 3, which we have already touched on significantly, Again, that was reviewed under the de novo standard of review by the court below, and that, again, is the correct standard of review to be applied here as a challenge to a jurisdiction or an error of law. But I think part of the confusion with both conclusion of law number two and conclusion of law number three seems to be with petitioner's use of an inclusion of the words medical prenatal care. In the petition for judicial review at the court below and the briefs to the court below and to this court, there's an insertion of those words in the conclusion of law two and three that are not actually there. Because what we're actually talking about in this case is the provision of chiropractic services, nothing more. And this conclusion of law number three is based on the failure to examine the patient, document the chiropractic care, and manage the chiropractic care of the patient. And the testimony at the hearing below before the board was that, again, 
The petitioner admitted in her own testimony that there was no vital signs, uh, that blood pressure wasn't taken for a pregnant patient despite reporting a history of scoliosis. And I mentioned before that 38 clinical notes were the same from January until July, but even more so glaring in this case was that for the three notes at the visits after July 10th, so after the patient had attempted childbirth, those three notes are identical to the three notes from January of the same year. There's nothing in there in the clinical notes that says that the patient just previously attempted childbirth. There's nothing in there documenting the history of the pregnancy or the history of the chiropractic care. And none of those findings of fact, again, with respect to conclusion of law three, were challenged. And when we're looking at the Administrative Procedure Act under 150B-41D, says an agency may use its experience, technical competence, and specialized knowledge in evaluation of the evidence presented. And so it's black letter law in North Carolina that licensing boards do not need expert testimony on what the standard of care is, nor do they need expert testimony on whether or not that standard of care had been breached. And in Leahy versus the North Carolina Board of Nursing, the Supreme Court held that when there is sufficient evidence in the record, the board may use its own expertise to determine whether or not that standard of care was violated. This was reaffirmed in Watkins, and in citing to Leahy, the Watkins court said that Leahy was the deference that courts give to administrative bodies in exercising its fact-finding duties in a case. Furthermore, the Supreme Court looked at the composition of the board, what the Practice Act's authority is for the Board of Nursing, and, or excuse me, the Board of Dental Examiners, and said, if a board is given this much authority under its Practice Act to establish examination procedures, set rules on licensing and scope of licensing, then the board is the body that makes the determination as to whether or not that standard of care would be breached. Counselor, can I go back to a statement you made earlier? You said if it's, this is just about chiropractic care, then why was there a ruling about her, the failure to secure appropriate care for a pregnant woman? I mean, why was that, if she had not been pregnant, how then are you arguing that the chiropractic care was not there if what they were doing on that particular day had nothing to do with chiropractic care? If we're looking at the specific provision of chiropractic care. For one instance, the Webster technique was performed by the petitioner on the, on the patient, which is a specific type of technique that's often used on pregnant patients. That's not anywhere in the clinical notes. So. The purpose of your clinical notes is if a new chiropractor comes in, let's say that somebody has to fill in for you for a day because you're out of the, out of the practice, I want to be able to pick up your notes and look and say, what was the pain levels for X, Y, and Z at the last visits? How have those pain levels changed through the course of treatment? What adjustment techniques were performed at the last uh, visits? What adjustment techniques have been successful or unsuccessful? If a new chiropractor were to come in and pick up the clinical notes of this patient in, let's say, on July 2nd of 2022, they would have been the exact same since January. So there's no way to say, this is what's been going on, this is how this patient has been treated, here's the scope of treatment that you should apply today. Not even putting in the techniques that have been performed for the adjustment techniques. And the petitioner testified at hearing that that should have been documented in there. So that's about the provision of chiropractic services. What techniques did you perform? Was that properly documented? Was there examinations and re-examinations? None of those things occurred. And the board found that that was a failure to render acceptable care in the practice of the profession. Well, but again, focusing specifically on conclusion of law two, which I think is where, again, Judge Thompson is, is, is trying to focus on, you know, the, I mean, that finding isn't about the failure to document. It's not about the failure to examine, it's not about, or that conclusion, I'm sorry, it's not about documenting, examination, that kind of thing. It's specifically about this act of, of failing to secure appropriate medical care, sort of, separate, sort of separate and apart from the course of treatment. And, and, and I think the question, I think the argument from your, your colleague is that, you know, a, a chiropractor showing up in a labor and delivery ward you know, where their patient happens to be or to visit their, their longtime patient, just in and of itself, that isn't constituting the practice of chiropractic. And so then the, 
question becomes, in that scenario, what duty does a chiropractor have to their patient in, you know, in, in that particular moment? Right. And where is that documented? Where is that articulated by the board? Where is, where is that in the board's regulations? There is nothing in the board's regulations specifically to that point. But I think if we're looking at, again, the scope here is, did the court below apply the correct standard? And was that standard applied to the it's facts? It's a de novo standard. Correct. And I think it's important to note that the court below in uh, finding of fact 25 said that the board's conclusions of law, too, is supported by the findings that Dr. Federich failed to keep adequate clinical notes or records and failed to perform proper examination of the patients. I mean, even though it is a de novo standard, as I said previously, in order to review that again and look at the law again, we have to look at what the evidence was presented at the hearing, and we have to look at the, ev the testimony in the records and the documentary evidence, and that's how you reach conclusions of law. That's what the board did below, and that's what the court also did below, is looking at what evidence is in the record and whether or not that supports the conclusions of law. And so the conclusion of law number two with respect to negligence is still supported by the failure to document manage the chiropractic care of the patient. I, you know, I noticed that um, she has she offers birthing classes and um, had a podcast about the advantages of home birth um, and alternatives to uh, to giving birth at the hospital. Uh, what is a chiropractor allowed to do, uh, you know, with regard to labor and delivery and prenatal care? provide chiropractic services. And that, that anything beyond that would exceeding the scope of the licensure. So again, I mentioned the Webster technique, which is a common technique that is used on pregnant patients. So when we're looking at the practice of chiropractic, as it's defined in the statutes, is about regulating nerve endings, the spine, and the, the traditional adjustments that you think of of a chiropractic professional providing. That's the extent of chiropractic profession is uh, alleviating the spine to um, adjust the nerve endings. It's, it's nothing more than that. What does it look like in, in, uh, when you're in, in a delivery situation? If a chiropractor is in a, in a delivery? Yeah. In that situation, that would be exceeding the scope of a licensure, right? If a chiropractor is in a delivery room performing a uh, birth, that would be exceeding the scope of, of the license. And then that would be something that's subject to also the, the medical board's jurisdiction because the chiropractic services are defined by statute as to what is considered the practice and the science of chiropractic. So anything beyond that would be exceeding the scope of the license. So then why require the chiropractic to secure appropriate care under those circumstances? The failure to secure appropriate care is not the same as failure to providing appropriate care. So providing appropriate care would have been, if it was in the scope of the licensure, in treating the patient at that time. But failure to securing appropriate care is a, is a distinct act from actually providing appropriate care. So in this situation, if there was no other professional that was treating, the chiropractor had told the patient that she could be the primary care provider and handle all prenatal um, matters with respect to that patient, that's failure to secure the appropriate care by uh, referring out to another provider, by sending for blood work or other analysis or ultrasounds. There's other steps that can be taken that would say, I can't do this, I can't handle this as a chiropractor, you need to go see X, Y, and Z, and then have them treat you for those things. But that's or, not on a 90-143. You, you just went through a whole list of what the chiropractors expected to do, but they didn't do that in the terms of a pregnant woman going through the birthing at that point, but then you want the chiropractor to also be responsible for securing appropriate care for the prenatal moment. Not for the prenatal moment. Again, it's the all, everything that occurred prior to July 10th is also within that uh, negligence standard that the board looked at. Like I said before, even if everything had gone well on July 10th, the things that occurred prior to that date could have still been found to be negligence in the practice of the profession by not doing all of those things, such as taking vital signs, getting blood work, having ultrasounds done, referring to other providers. All of those other sorts of steps could have been taken 
that would have ensured that the patient had appropriate medical care at the time when July 10th came. Did the patient testify that she expected Dr. Federowitz to deliver this baby? The patient did testify that after meeting with doulas and midwives that they weren't a good fit. I believe one of the midwives or doulas was late for their appointment and that made her uneasy. And she testified specifically that the petitioner appellant said, that's okay, you and your partner can do this at your home and I will be there with you. The patient also testified that at some point a Doppler was obtained by the petitioner appellant and was brought to the home and used to check the fetal heart rate and the petitioner appellant herself testified that she had never even used one of these before and that she went got it from the midwife brought it back to the house and then used that while the patient was in delivery and so all of these other steps have been taken by the petitioner appellant to say I can do all of this for you I you don't have to find somebody else and that's failure to secure the appropriate care not failure to render the acceptable care, which would have been exceeding the scope of so license. So when she used a Doppler and then, tells the, and then tells the patient that the heartbeat seems normal, is it your contention that she's uh, basically lulling the patient into a, you know, um, a, false, a sense of false security? Don't know what the, what the intention there was. Um, perhaps to calm the patient down, uh, but the patient also testified at the hearing that she recalls on two occasions on July 10th asking the petitioner appellant whether or not she should go to the hospital, and the petitioner appellant responded no. So that would be a logical conclusion that the petitioner appellant was saying everything is fine, we can do this here. And again, that goes back to conclusion of law number one with respect to the advertising and the unethical conduct is holding themselves out as something that they were not. Of course, the, the board didn't, doesn't say anywhere in the findings of fact that, um, that the patient asked Dr. Fedowitz about going to the hospital and told her not to. That's not in the findings of fact, no, but that is documented in, in the record and in the testimony of the patient. Um, and it, moving isn't, to- Isn't the act here though leaving the home is, is without securing additional medical care and just, just essentially leaving the patient to themselves? Is, is that not the failure to secure proper care, but then also where is that standard articulated? That's one of the acts, but again, I think it's the other acts that precede even July 10th that culminate in July 10th incident. Okay, got it. So. When we're looking at the probationary terms, and I'll speak on this generally since I'm short on time, this has pretty much already been decided by Hardy versus North Carolina Board of Chiropractic Examiners, and the petitioner appellant wants to use the de novo standard of review for order paragraph number six, but not use it for order paragraph number four. Both of them are probationary terms. Both of them should be reviewed under the arbitrary and capricious standard, which the court below did. And in Hardy versus North Carolina Board of Chiropractic Examiners, this court applied the arbitrary and capricious standard to discipline imposed on a chiropractor, of which both order paragraph six and order paragraph four would apply. And in that case, this court said that the discipline imposed on a chiropractor is co-signed to the discretion of the board. If the findings of fact and the conclusions of law warrant discipline, then the discipline should be left in the realm of the board to determine what that discipline is. We respectfully ask that this court would affirm the decision of the Superior Court below and affirm and uphold the amended final agency decision in order from the board. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Counselor, before you begin, let's start with showing up at the hospital identifying herself as a friend. Please t walk me down from disingenuous. At the time that she left at 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the afternoon, and until she was informed that the birth mother and the partner were at the hospital, um, she had no idea. It, it, it's, it's inconceivable for me, for somebody who is holding themselves out as a baby doctor, as a birth attendant, um, to leave when that happened. 
And when she was called back to give moral support when the, the couple was at the hospital, she was a friend. She wasn't acting as a chiropractor at that moment. She pulled out a Doppler. Friends typically do that when you're watching your friend in labor? Well, the, 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 the true facts are that the, the birth mother wanted the Doppler, and so Dr. Federowitz provided it to her by getting it from the nurse midwife. And then at, at the point where, where it was provided by, by, the, by the partner, and at any rate, um, that was something that was at the request of the, of, of the birth mother. Dr. Federowitz said, I don't know how to read this. I can tell you what the number says. And so she was not acting as a birth attendant when, when, they, were, when they were going about that business. Even in a moral support or a comforting friend, your friend is there in labor and leaving. How is that showing up as a friend again? Obviously, complications are starting to unveil, right? And she leaves. But yet she wants to show up as a friend. Just, I'm just trying to understand to, to connect the dots. It is our position that when Dr. Federowitz left, because of family obligations, had worked the next day, um, that the patient was stable and was not, clearly not in labor. Uh, whether that's a finding of a well, dispute of fact or not is, is, is unfortunate because it's our position that it was very clear that this patient was dressed, that this person was dressed, um, having a meal um, and sitting down in a, in a sitting room. But separate that, um, the question here is whether this, this licensee should be judged by the standards of a medical doctor when, when she left that day. When she came back, she wasn't, she wasn't holding herself out as a provider. She was holding herself out as a friend of this lady who had been called to, to provide moral support at the hospital. So even that now, was their relationship. Excuse me. I'm sorry, sir. So even now she is denying that she held herself out as a primary physician. Don't Absolutely. need anybody else. I've got this. You don't need to call anyone else. We'll get through this together. Absolutely. As friends. If you look at the materials that are provided by um, these birthing sessions, you will see different types of of, um, of material in there. You'll see that. You have this choice, this choice, this choice, but these choices are yours. There's an overwhelming population of pregnant women in this country, in North Carolina, that do not have a licensed OBGYN, do not have a licensed nurse midwife, but are relying on a home birth using a certified midwife or a doula. According to this, uh, this administrative agency's decision, Dr. Federowitz cannot treat those patients because it would require her to manage the prenatal obstetric care of these patients while she's treating them for chiropractic. That's just beyond any authority that this administrative agency has at all. That's a, that's a decision, uh, decision order number six. <laughs> But that's just during the period of probation, isn't that, isn't that correct? That is correct, yes. And it's related to the violation, so wouldn't that make it relevant to, uh, um, to basically helping her succeed with her probation? It is the condition of the probation. And, right. And the reason that's wrong is because it's based on the perceived authority that they can regulate um, obstetric and prenatal health care through this, this woman. And that's, that's the point here. Um, they didn't say that she was out of the scope of practice, which they, they possibly could have, um, to, to bring back your point, uh, Judge Thompson. Um, but that's not why they decided. They said that she had the, 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 the obligation to do what a baby doctor would do. If you look at the complaint, from Dr. Perez. Doesn't, any doesn't every chiropractor have a duty to accurately and properly document their uh, 
encounters with a patient? Yes, yes. And in that regard, we don't, we don't rely on that. We rely on the word manage in conclusion of law number three, where the word manage, the prenatal care of this patient, is just wrong. But they say prenatal care doesn't exist in that conclusion of law. They say manage the care of the patient. But it's a pregnant patient. And at the end of the day, the conclusion uh, that they reach was only based on um, to manage the care of this patient when, when, the, when the doctor or chiropractic knew or should have known that the patient had not, not secured other primary prenatal care, which is, is inconceivable. Dr. Perez, in her complaint, said that, um, that with routine care, a breach presentation is usually identified prior to delivery. A cesarean section is typically recommended the hospital protocol should be invoked and used that a breech birth should be attempted only with the, with the, the attendance of a provider uh, with the skill set citing this, she was citing the statistics of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. This woman was judged um, on the basis of, uh, of obstetrics and gynecology, which is not what this board is, life, is, is authorized to do. Well, the complainant's not on the board, though, am I correct? That's a complainant that you're quoting, am I correct? Yes, yes. And the complainant's not on the board, so the complainant, the complainant was complaining of that, but did not have anything, did not um, prepare this uh, final agency decision. Yeah. Now, one of the things, if, if I may, mm -hmm. one of the things that is um, very important is this issue or whether or not the board can, um, can reach inside themselves and decide what the, what the standard of care is. They don't necessarily need expert witness to testify that this rule is inside the chiropractic board's regulations. If that's the case, that we wouldn't be here. There's no rule, regulation, or position statement with respect to the chiropractic care of a pregnant patient. Do you get, disagree with your colleague's citation to Leahy and Watkins? Um, if I may, I can give you two citations which um, disagree with that. Mm -hmm. um, and they're both Court of, uh, both Court of Appeals decisions. The uh, Mitchell versus United, um, University of North Carolina Board of Governors cited on page one of my reply brief. They say in Mitchell, the, per the examiner's termination of employment was based on violations of the school policy governing the petitioner's duty as a professor. In that case, the board didn't cite to any outside rule because it was a policy which is already in place. In this case, we don't have a policy with respect to the treatment of pregnant patients that they can cite or, or refer to as the standard of care. The same rule obtains in the case of Farlow versus State Board of Chiropractic Examiners, uh, a 1985 case. It's rather old, but um, it's after my time as a clerk, so it's probably pretty, pretty recent. Um, it says that the, the petitioner was negligent in the provision of chiropractic services um, when it concluded that there was no medical justification for the treatment proposed. Um, which constituted an over-utilization of chiropractic services, they applied in that case their own position statement with respect to the rules that required chiropractors to establish treatment plans based on a thorough exam and a, appropriate diagnoses. So in both of the cases, they stand for the proposition that it's okay to reach into your own, your own board and come up with a, a standard of care if there is one. And in our position, we don't believe there is. With respect to the term net, uh, re reasonableness on our fourth um, standard, um, our fourth argument. Sir, um, sir you're um, well over your Oh, no, I, I just wanted to say that, okay. that we, we stand on the, the, the citations in the brief and the fact that reasonableness counts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That concludes oral argument in this matter. Uh, we'll take this under advisement. I want to uh, thank
Thank you both for your, for your arguments this afternoon. We may adjourn. between you and me.